Welcome back to the channel everybody. I'm John with Renaissance Millworks. Today we're going to be doing a video on constructing a vanity top out of a walnut slab. I was uh, contacted by a design builder to provide this top for this uh, addition you see here. This house is a major renovation onto an existing home. The renovation is actually bigger than the existing home. Um, the home has been on a family farm for many, many years, and I've been a friend of the uh, family for many, many years. Um, you can see a little bit of the main house over the hill there. And this house has got some spectacular views, and the inside of the house is quite spectacular. The designer builder has... Uh, quite a vision and, and a gift for uh, spectacular designs. So you can see here, this is the kitchen and the great room. It's a great room for entertaining, great family room. And right off to the side of the room here is the powder room in which I'm going to be putting the vanity top in. It's going to run right from left to left to right, whatever you call it, wall to wall. And it's going to be floating. There's going to be no cabinet under it. So you're just going to see a slab when you walk in. And um, they picked out this pretty cool tile. And in the slab, you'll see there's an opportunity to put some um, epoxy in. And we're going to be matching that tile with that epoxy inlay. So the story of the slab goes back nine months. In April of 2019, I answered a Facebook ad where somebody had advertised some free walnut logs if you get them out of the yard. So of course I answered yes. I went and got them. They sat around for a while and I finally got to milling them up. Here's a picture of uh, the same log the slab came out of and loaded onto the mill. The slab we took in particular is one of those center ones. And you can see when they dropped the tree they did not cut the um, wedge deep enough so when they drop the tree it's split vertically up the tree and you'll see that later in the slab so it, it goes all the way back to cutting the tree down um, and they air dried for six months went in the kiln for about 10 days out of the kiln into storage So when I was contacted, I uh, went out and picked this slab out. It um, Only about 60% of it is usable for, for this job because of that big check that's in it. So it's kind of perfect for this job. Um, you know, it's five foot three inches wide. And so that just gets into those checks a little bit. So I kind of had set this, this thing aside for a couple of months. Um, you know, I sell slabs and I just said it wasn't available and it sat because it's got this big check and, you know, you can fill that, but, you know, I like to sell slabs that don't have that in it and, uh, it's got a bit of a twist in it, but, and it's got this rotten spot in it and it's not that bad on the other side, but after consulting with the customer and the designer, they, they wanted the rotten spot up so we could dig it out and uh, fill it full of epoxy and and get some color into it and uh, I didn't show making the template but um, I made a template which is very handy for work like this because especially wall to wall three sides like that you know corners are never 90 degrees they just it, it doesn't work out that way so with the template you can set it on the slab you can move it you can flip it and decide which side of the slab is going to face forward um, you know, just move it all over the slab and decide where you want it. And, uh, when I make the slab, I also scribe the wall as well. So you can get the, the bends and bows in the wall and, uh, you can maximize the amount of slab you use. Um, and we're going to be using every bit of the slab as we can. It's going to have a, um, a vessel sink sitting on top. It's rather large, so we're going to need all the square inches we can get. So, um, yeah, next next step is to uh, decide which way it faces. 
mark a line and cut off the excess. So time to break out one of my favorite tools, the Makita track saw cordless. I've been a carpenter for decades and only recently purchased this saw and wondered how I made it all these years without a track saw. This is without a doubt one of the most favorite tools I've ever owned. I don't know how I live so long without a track saw. It um, makes cutting straight lines a piece of cake, a breeze, a pleasure. Um, the dust collection on this thing is excellent. You see me putting a little tape on the other side. They have a little opening where you can see the blade. If you tape that up, it's almost completely dust free. Um, just love this tool. You can put the, the track has got some kind of really grippy pads on the bottom. So once you uh, put it down, it doesn't move, it doesn't slide. Um, my second most favorite tool in the world is actually that little button sitting on the slab there that's a remote control for my dust collection system that is the biggest time saver I have in the shop how many times you walk back and forth to the dust collector um, is just uncountable and the amount of minutes and uh, that saves me is incredible so love that track saw it with a bow in the slab it just falls short of getting all the way through it so um, you know, once I plane this thing down, it'll cut all the way through it in one pass. But um, I do it in multiple passes just to make it easier on the saw. Now here, um, you know, next step is addressing this rotten spot. Um, it's where a branch had grown out and died on the tree, and it had you know, create, it created a rotten spot in the tree. So all this wood is like cork. It's punky. So um, you got to get it all out of there. Um, it, it, nothing's, uh, it, it's just worthless. Nothing's going to stick to it, um, adhere to it. Um, you can stabilize it um, with CA glue or stabilizing epoxy, but we want to create this spot here for um, an epoxy inlay. So we're getting all this bad wood out of the way. So any means necessary, chisel, wire brush, pick, whatever it takes and it's um, like an archaeological dig because you're trying to get rid of the bad stuff but leave the good stuff so wire wheels wire brushes they all work so um, it's just a tedious little job but you got to get it out of there and uh, here I am using my uh, remote control again love it but um, once you get all that out of there my next step will be to uh, epoxy quick seal coat all that area so it uh, keeps bubbles from arising and kind of fills in all the little nooks and crannies in there so when we pour our main pour it doesn't create problems. Here I am mixing up the um, epoxy for sealing that spot. It's a um, stone coat countertop product. It's called Quick Coat. It's a one-to-one -one mix and it um, it's a quick set so your working time is about 15 20 minutes on it um, it's not f fully cured probably for about four hours but you know the advantage is you're not um, delayed like 24 hours um, you can do it a couple of times a day um, so it's a one-to-one -one mix so i'm using scales here um, i think it came out 29 grams on on part a so you want to double it so you want 58 grams total of course your cup is zeroed out it's a really thick epoxy so you really got to mix a lot um it's going to get air in it it's just the way it is but you paint it on thin this is not a casting epoxy it's not epoxy you want to have any kind of depth with because it um it activates so quickly it creates heat and if you have any kind of mass ie a pool of it um, any thicker than like an eighth of an inch it's gonna create a lot of heat even you know if you have some left over in the cup um, that you don't use and it's over a half inch deep I will set that cup aside somewhere I will not put it in the trash I'll set it in the middle of the slab or somewhere away from combustibles because it, it gets hot so you want to work this into all the nooks and crannies and that's going to keep bubbles from arising when you come in with your uh, main deep pour and it's also going to help to adhere the final epoxy to the wood. 
So my customer decided that she wanted a backsplash for the vanity. So off to the slab room. Luckily I had another slab to accommodate that uh, border and it's actually from the same log. And voila, there are now two slabs. So we must get to work. The backsplash is going to be about 10 inches tall from the base cut where it meets the vanity top to the top of the live edge. Um, the live edge will be obviously on top rolling away from the wall towards the vanity in a downward fashion so um, I kind of have to square it up and measure off the back of the slab so I get the dimensions right and these are just rough cuts. I'm going to do final cuts after it's finished. Um, just don't want to have to uh, router sled any additional material that I don't have to. So the track saw, as I said, just comes up a little short getting all the way through. Probably falls about a 16th or an eighth short. So right here, I just crack it like an egg, pop it out, and off to the joiner. This slab also shared the same knot hole as the other slab. It's the same knot hole just further out on the tree. So it's pretty cool. Uh, when I install them, I'm going to line them up so they are in line with one another. Uh, it needed to be flattened out with the uh, belt sander here. And it's going to get the same quick coat treatment prior to uh, some colored epoxy. Here I'm taping up all the bottoms of the slabs where the epoxy might spill out when I fill these voids. Um, it's important to sand around the area that you're taping so the tape gets a good stick and it's not sticking to raised grain or something that's going to allow the epoxy to seep through. Epoxy's thick, but it's just, it's thick but it's slow and it goes pretty much anywhere water would go. It just takes longer. So um, it's important to tape these things up very good and if you think it might leak out of there, tape it up. And um, actually you'll see later, I should have taped this thing up even more than I did. Um, just wasn't sufficient. So tape, more tape and over tape. That's the only advice I can give. Tape is cheap and epoxy is expensive. So my game plan with this slab is to pour the epoxy before I uh, flatten it with the router sled so I don't have to do it twice. Um, you know, you could do it either way, but if I pour it and then flatten it, it'll cut through the epoxy and it'll be perfectly flat. And, you know, if there's no major voids, I'll just have to touch it up. This is, this is kind of setting it up to see what it'll look like uh, just rough cut you know I'm gonna scribe cut it so it it sits the backsplash sits on the vanity flat but uh, this is all rough cut just want to kind of get a look see what it looks like finally getting to the fun part we're gonna try to match that floor tile there so we're just gonna start throwing colors in and see what we come up with my kids always like watching uh, pole barn videos when he Speeds it up and it sounds like squirrels talking. So this is for you, girls. My wife and I just kind of eyeballed how much uh, epoxy we thought we'd need. Ended up having a little too much. Maybe a lot too much, but I'd rather have too much than not enough when you're trying to match colors back up. It's 
can be tough, especially when you're not writing anything down. We're just kind of winging it. So we started with the teal and uh, went ahead and added some blue. Uh, then we, we picked up the white and we put some pewter in there. Then we went back and put some more blue in it. And uh, we did a couple of test cups yesterday or the day before. And, um, you know, we just did one with pure teal, one with teal and blue, and one with teal, blue, white, and uh, pewter. And it, it came out the best. So we, we actually did experiment a little bit. So we kind of knew which way we we're going with it. About now, my wrist is just worn out. I know it's going to put air into it, but I want it thoroughly mixed. And it is a slow set epoxy. It's a three to one, so it's for deep pours. Um, it's going to be 24 hours, maybe sandable. So uh, we'll see. Um, just uh, see how it turns out. Our little test uh, cups that we um, poured, they didn't take long, but. You know, this is going to be a bigger pour. But it's important to scrape the sides when mixing this and make sure you get the hardener, all the hardener off the side, all the resin off the side. You know, when you put the uh, powder in there, the, make sure that gets sucked down and dispersed. And ideally, you really wouldn't, you want to mix this whole thing by hand. But uh, as I said before, the arthritis in the wrist was kicking and it's a, a slow set, so usually on a slow set, your uh, your bubbles are going to work their way out. Big bunch of white in there. The white really gives it the highlights. It looks like um, it's hard to explain. You just get these really bright highlights when you swirl it, and it uh, almost looks like it's lit up with neon lights. I recommend the white anytime you're doing a, a colored mix to get a kind of a pearlescent look. And we adjust accordingly as we go. You kind of mix, see what the color looks like, add some blue, add some green, add white, whatever, and adjust as you go. Um, there's no right or wrong. And then when I pour this, you know, I didn't show it in the earlier video, but if you look on the back, back on the slab there, you can see it in the background. Occasionally I've gone around all the pour sites with a little bead of um, latex caulk that'll act as a dam to keep the uh, epoxy from um, spilling out uh, on the table and contain it um, you want to pour it a little proud of whatever void you're you're filling because it's gonna seep in and ooze into all the nooks and crannies and over you know several hours it'll go in and you'll come back you know four hours later and you'll have to add some more so I try to build it up pretty pretty high on my little dam so as it seeps in I don't come up short and um, you know then another thing that I'm going to do on this table is after it sets for a little while I'm going to come back and do a swirl pattern in the void and you know try to put a, de a design into it um, that kind of looks like marble you know you got to time it just right if you do it too early it'll just blend back to a homogenous state. If you do it too late, the resin's already started to kick in and it's kind of jellified and you don't want to disturb that um, catalyst at all. So you kind of got to catch it just right. And I'm still messing with that timing, but uh, it's a lot of fun. That lovely lady there is my wife, Carolyn. I can't take all the credit for mixing up this wonderful color. She helped out a lot. We're going to have to tackle this build in two or three videos. It's, this video is getting kind of long. Please tune in for the second video where we're going to finish this pour and come back after it's hard and level this slab and sand the thing. Thanks for watching and be sure to tune in for video two. Please consider subscribing and God bless.